move along. Let's jump into some of this. All right, let's, um, let's change gears a little bit. Let's talk about uh, TCP. So here's the stuff we got to get through, like, really quickly. By the way, again, I don't see anybody nodding off. Is this OK? Is this all right? Is this what you want to hear? Do you want to hear more of this or less? Yes. I'm sorry? Do we, do we have a chance to send uh, more than one, one line of code in send socket programming? Uh, do we have a chance to send more than one, one line of code? Send it? Send it. Yes, yeah. you can send, uh, if I understand your question, can you send more than one? Uh, you can, like, let, me, let me put it this way. I think I, think I understand your question. If not, tell me. So with UDP, what happens is, if you're using UDP, your, let's say you have uh, you know, a 65,000 byte uh, piece of data that you want to send. What will happen will be, that thing will get blocked up into you know, some, some multiple, you know, 1024 or something, and sent out, packaged up, and sent out, and just blasted out. No error correction is going to get dropped, right? And the way that that happens is that's that big chunk of 65,000 you know, K of data, you are responsible for sending it. So you got, you got, I got this holy macro, I got this big stuff, I got to start this loop that says, hey, take 1K blocks, and we'll see that later if my demonstrations work. <laughs> take that 1K block, send it. Take the 1K, next 1K, send it. Am I done? No, I still got more. Take it, send it send it, send it all the way to the end. And when you are at it, your end of file or your end of buffer or whatever you're trying to send when you're done, then you say, OK, I'm done, shut down. TCP, if you have that 65K you know, gigrondo monstrosity to send, it's going to start, it's a streaming protocol, right? So it's not going to packet it up, right? It's going to make sure it gets from one point to the other. So it's going to start streaming out like bytes into that wire. And this is where we go back to like the performance tuning, you know, all that kind of stuff. If your NIC cards, if you're getting smoked, you know, the buffers are full or, you know, you're, you're you know, whatever, any number of reasons, um, that thing will start to hit a wall and start to back off. So it's, it's literally streaming, you know. Does that make, does that, okay, good. That was a good question. Question. I'm sorry? Can you briefly explain what uh, an environment is in Python and how can it be used with expanding templates? Uh, an environment variable? Yeah. No, an environment uh, which you can create with, I don't know, environment of something. It's the command you issue to create. For example, you have um, a CSV file that has a lot of uh, a lot of um, values for variables, and right. you have a template that contains those variables. And in order to expand that template with the variables in the CSV file, you have to first create an environment for Python to go and replace the variables. So, what actually is that environment, and why? It has so to be I, that's a good question, and I think um, what might help that would be when we talk about spreadsheets. Um, just as like here, when we go to send transmit uh, packets or bytes or whatever out the wire, we spin up an object, and that object has a job, and that job encompasses certain things. I'm going to, you know, I don't know, format the data. I'm going to like wait for the NIC card, you know, the interrupt on the NIC card to you know open up so I can send a stream of bytes into the buffer. You know, that that sort of stuff. Same thing is true of let's say a spreadsheet. You're going you're gonna to act essentially the same way. You're going to create a spreadsheet object in memory that represents what is going to be the spreadsheet, the cells and the, uh, you know, the, the formatting of that cell, that, that sort of stuff. And it takes care of the lower level stuff for you. So you don't have to go in and you know, move pixels around on a screen, for example. Does that answer your question? So you'll see this. It's, it's done all the time in object-oriented programs. You have 
um, a set of libraries that when you want to do something, you spin up an object and those libraries get copied into, those methods or functions get copied into that object. And then all you have to do, you know, you give that object a name, is just reference, you know, use those little methods. And the advantage to like a object-oriented programming language in doing that is I, I can have as many of those as, you know, are, my memory will hold in my machine. If I'm a monolithic machine and I have to take care of, you know, building spreadsheet and then getting a request for, I gotta, I gotta put that in a sequence uh, order of operations, right? Like I, I gotta, I've gotta take care of my spreadsheet and I gotta let this guy wait while I'm taking care of that spreadsheet. Or I gotta send out this packet and I gotta let this guy wait while I'm doing that. With an object-oriented language, I can spin up an object let it do its thing, spin up another object, let it do its thing. So it's infinitely more scalable than a procedural language, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? All right, so uh, let's, let's talk about some of these. Uh, OS Walk. So super powerful uh, part of the OS um, module, the operating system module, is, is called OS Walk. And let me, let me just go there. Uh, what's the password? Vagrant. All right. File. We are looking for part one, right? Open. Part. Did I put that in TCP maybe? Hold on. Let me just go here. Uh, OS. Let's walk. All right. Let's see if this is it. Yep. Okay. So here, what we're doing is we're going to we're going to pull in the Python module. We're going to ask, hey, where do you want to start searching from? What directory you want, you want to start searching from? Uh, we'll key that in. Remember we talked about the get working current directory? We're going to see where we are, what's the current directory. We're going to put it in start, right? Um, then we're going to execute this function. And Python has this object called OS walk that will literally walk through, down through your entire directory structure and print out every, give you a listing of every directory and every file then go into each one of those directories and print out every directory and every file that it finds. Then go into each one of those subdirectories and on and on and on. And it will allow you to do that from top down or bottom up, right? It's really extremely powerful. Hold on. And what we're doing here, what we're doing here is when we execute, we're in a big for loop here. We're going to execute this, this function called OS walk. And this is where we're going to start, the directory we're going to start from. And as it goes in, it's going to say, all right, here's Vince's directory. Here's the whole tree. Um, I'm going to pull out the root, the directory that I'm in, and the files that I found in there. And then I'm going to do that, let's say it's um, you know, C colon uh, users. It's going to be, you know, uh, directory is going to be users and all the files. He's going to print out one of them. It's going to loop back up here. He's going to get the next directory, file, et cetera, all the way down. It's better to show you this than it is to talk about it. Hold on. So let's do from home. Yeah, so um, there's a better one in, let me do it in, in the, uh, with Windows. It's actually, better. Bear with me here. Uh, let me go back up. My code, um, where were we? That was in TCP? Uh, find file. This is a, uh, my directory is a lot 
My directory uh, on my Windows machine is like my bedroom when I was 14 years old, a complete mess. <laughs> All right, so let's, <laughs> let's start out with, uh, I'll search from C, you know, users. Uh, v. Kelly, uh, I'll do, um, I don't know, Python 2.7. There we go. So um, what we did was we said, here's a starting point. Here's the directory I want to start at. Uh, OS walk, go get me a bunch of stuff. Go read the first level of the, the directory came back and said, okay, here's what I found. And there are 12, I found 12 subdirectories in that directory. And here's their names. And I found 89 files in this one directory, in this primary directory that I'm looking in. Now, you know, I'll just, I see what we're doing, we're just, we just dump them out. Right? Very, very, very powerful. And we did that with one like statement, basically. Um, in here, this wasn't very exciting. This is just the, the VM, virtual machine. I just said search from the home, you know, the home directory. And I found three subdirectories, uh, you know, and then none, none of the directories in there. I, this makes sense? So we're going to use this in really for everything. When we you know, build our server, we've got to have the ability to search down through directories to get the files that the clients are asking for. Okay, so where are we? So we talked about OS walk. Ah, oh, good. Actually, something we can... All right, so let's do a simple message passing with TCP. So what we're going to do is we've got a client and a server. Um, one's called, you know, TCP client. One is imaginatively called TCP server. He's going to post a listen. He's going to do th go through all the stuff that we talked about up until now. And he's going to post that listen, right? He's going to sit there just waiting. Client's going to connect in, right? The client is going to connect in uh, and send a message to that server. Server's going to accept that message. He's going to send in, you know, a hello server message. Server is going to send back hello client. Pretty cool, huh? So let's do that. It's uh, TCP. Uh, come on. There we go. All right. So let me uh, open up. Open up uh, TCP client and TCP server, right? Okay, so here's where we, here's where we are. I don't know why it's doing this. So uh, we're going to do all the stuff we just talked about. Um, you know, we're going to tell it what stack to use. We want to use TCP. We want to spin up a server object, right? We want to bind that server object to an IP address that we enter in here. And we want to notice what I'm doing here. Remember we talked about typecasting? This has to be an integer. When I entered this port number, uh, the way that Python works with a raw input when you take something from a console, everything that returns is a string. So I can't put a string in here because this is expecting an integer. So here I'm typecasting this as an integer. I'm making it look like a number, right? Uh, this can be a string, and in fact, Python wants to see a string here. Here's where we post our listens, and one thing I'll point out uh, that servers do differently than clients. It's one of the big reasons they're different. Server will do all this stuff up here. It'll listen. It, it posts these listens, and then when a client comes in, when a client comes in, he'll set up another socket just for that client. Does that make sense? So the server's doing the big stuff, and the minute he senses something coming in, 
He's going to spin up an object for that client, and that's going to be the peer connection, the, the socket name, if you will. Everybody get that? That's, that's important. So this is where the real logic goes on, right? Here where, you know, the, the server, the server sensed that he got a connect message and he said, okay, here's the IP address it came from and here's the object and I'm going to refer to that from now on. Um, I print out what the address is and I'm going to say, okay, give me, I don't know, 1024 bytes, right? Because we're using a, a stream, we're using TCP, so this will be receive up to 1024 bytes, okay? Uh, and put it in a buffer. What do I say here? I say if data, the data is the buffer, what we just got in. If it's empty, it means that there's no more, the client has nothing more to send. So it means I'm done, right? I'm done, you know, print this. If there's data in there, it means that this receive got, got a stream of data. It's holding a block of data for us. So I drop in here, I say the message received, I print out the data, the address, sending a response, I send him back a message that says, you know, response, hello client. I close that connection for that socket, that particular socket. The guy on the other side, the client, sees the connection come down and he drops. Does, that, does everybody get that? And really, that's, then we spin back in a, I don't know why this is happening. Then we spin back in a loop. Uh, there is something funky going on with this machine. Um, then we spin back in a loop. Uh, you know, we ask, of course, do you want to continue this or not? But if we say yes, we just spin back up here and he's going to service this next listen. Uh, he's going to wait until somebody, another connection message comes in, at which point he goes through the whole, you know, deal again. He spins up another object, right? You know, does all the, the printing and stuff. Everybody get that? So do we want to see it blow up in real time? Huh? Okay. <laughs> this is why I wanted you guys to do it, so I could blame it on you <laughs> instead of it falling on me. All right. Let's run the module. Uh, and now we're going to give it the IP address that we're going to bind to, okay? And that should be, I think for this machine, it's 12.168.56. I think we were 101. What port number? Ah, that's a great point, though. Remember, those, those ports are uh, I-N-A-N or I-N-A-N, uh, whatever, you know, super orchestration organization owns those. Those are restricted numbers. So below a number you're not allowed to use, like DNS or, you know, um, but above, you've only got like, I think it's like one byte that actually represents the socket number. So I can't go above 65,535, right? So I've, I've got this little area that I can use any number I want. So it's got to be a high order number, right? Does that make sense? That's a good point, though. Let's do 55, 1, 2, 3. Sound good? Now, let's see this thing blow up. Hold on. Let me run it from, um, see if I can run it from the uh, Windows machine. And by the way, when you guys do this, you can use, um, 120, the local address, you can use, instead of having two separate machines, you can use 127.000, you know, 01, whatever, and you can run it on the same machine. So, uh, what are we doing? This one? All right, so let's, uh, let's run. Server's address is 192.168.56. What do we say? 168.56.101. Uh, and what port number was that? 5513. 55123? 5, 5, 5, oh, there we go. One that didn't blow up. So we saw the server sitting there, spinning, waiting for somebody to come in. 
Um, he's listening. He's got five of them sitting out there. One comes in. Hey, I got a request from, you know, me, 56.1. And oh, by the way, look at this number. Why is this number different? It's the opposite side. You get two gifts. Great, great pull. That is your, that is your connection. That's your peer connection there. So you've got to have a different number on this side than this side, right? Okay, so it comes in. Hey, I got this message. It was hello server. I'm going to send a response. Uh, and on the client side, we, we you know, say, hey, here's the, here's the socket name, socket name. Um, I'm sending a hello message, waiting for a response. Response back from, from the server, right? Then we, we're going to sit, we're, gonna, we're sitting on a, at the end of that while loop, that infinite loop. We're sitting there now. And we're waiting uh, for, for to, to say, hey, do you want me to shut this down or continue? So I'll say yes. Uh, let's start it up again. Oh, I think I just killed it. Uh, no, okay. Uh, 192.168.56.101. 101. And it was 55123, right? There we go. So we're sitting there looping. Uh, we've got, you know, we've got to service these. And this, again, this is like design, right? Programmatic design. If you think about this. While I'm sending uh, my stream, th there's a, a certain amount of finite resources in the machine, right? I've got a certain buffer size, I've got a certain bus size, I've got a certain amount of memory, blah, 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 blah. Um, while, you know, when I hand off this message to that uh, communication stack, the operating system is sitting there trying to do its thing, and I'm waiting. And guess what? Everybody behind me on that machine is waiting. It's called blocking. So I've, I've, you know, depending on how you write it, uh, these mechanisms are blocked. Now, the really good guys know how to do uh, non-blocking design, programmatic design, right? That's where they say, hey, look, operating system, here's a packet, get back to me when it's done. And they go on, they do their thing, the operating system comes back to them and says, hey, that was successful. On they go. You'll also see something similar in web design. When, when people are designing web messages or, or web screens, web servers, they go to extraordinary lengths to make the number of, uh, everybody know rest, you know, get, post, that sort of thing. They will, they will go out of their way, jump backwards over sideways to minimize the number of gets, and puts and posts because it's such an expensive operation. They, they've even gotten to the point where they will embed images in URLs and in HTML files that get shipped around, right? So that they don't have to go, they don't have to come in, paint a screen, like a, a web screen or your, your web page, and then go back out and ask, hey, can you give me that image, that, that PNG file? that had, you know, the actor's face on it, you know, whatever, and then paint that. that those are multiple requests that are going out, right? Does this make sense? So it's why uh, coders get so wrapped up in design and scalability, uh, you know, on and on and on. I'm done with my lecture. <laughs> All right, so let's shut this down. Uh, okay. What do you guys think so far? Good. All right. Let's, um, let's do a file transfer. So here, guess what? We're not doing anything differently than what we did with the last example, except that we're moving, the messages are changed, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to listen. Connection request is going to come in. We're going to say, 
the, the client is going to send the name of a file that he wants the server to serve him, right? Server is going to go look that file up, and it's, it's going to have to be in the current directory because uh, we don't have any logic in there to do any searching. Um, and then he's going to send it out, send that file out in chunks of 1024 blocks. It's going to get collected on the client side. He's going to, uh, you know, it's, it's the, what the client is going to do is he's going to send out a connection request. And he's going to say, hey, give me this server. Give me this, this uh, file name. Server's going to come back with the start of the file. It's going to come into his buffer. And he's going to say, okay, I'm getting the file. I've got to open my local file. I've got to open it for writing. And then I've got to copy out what the server just sent me into that file. It's like a local file operation, right? Like we were just doing earlier, writing stuff to disk. So he's writing that's the, all the stuff that's coming in from the server, he's writing it out to disk. And then when he's done, when, when there's no more data coming in, he says, okay, shut down the socket and close the file. That's my file transfer, right? That's what's going to happen here, I hope. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, follow TCP, okay, so. Follow TCP server two, right? Let's open. So that should be, ser if that's server two, yeah. Okay. Let me just spin him up. Um, what's this? 192.168.56.1.1. Uh, what port do you guys want? What? Oh, that's, that's cheating. We're, we're going to do that, though, a little bit later. Um, let's do, let's do 45,000. We are going to do that. All right, so now he's listening. Let's go to client two. Let's go to this, the next iteration of this and just see. All right, client two. Open him up. Now, um, really not a, lot of, not a lot of differences. Again, I'm going to take the IP address, the TCP port number, and this time, I'm going to say, hey, what file do you want me to go ask the server to give you? I'm going to issue a connect to that listening server. I'm going to send him the file name that we just entered in here, right? That's where I send. Then I'm going to kind of open up my file, my local file to write to disk, right? I'm going to open up that file name. And I'm going to, I'm going to drop into this loop, and I'm just going to receive block after block after block. 1024 blocks until I'm done. Yes. Sorry? It's a great question. Are, are blocks, the blocks equivalent to maximum segment size? So, no. This is a totally arbitrary number, and I should have pointed that out. That's a great point. This is a totally arbitrary number. I can make that number 65, 535. What I'm saying is, but um, if I do that, if I make this 65, 535, and I'm doing a receive, I'm blocking while I'm waiting, right? So the more I'm sitting there waiting, I, I send this, hey, because I'm, uh, this is not a good program, right? I, I'm going to issue something. I'm telling the operating system to go wait on that port, and you call me when it's ready, and I'm going to sit here waiting for you to give me something which is what it's doing now. So when I make these numbers lower, my, my wait time, hopefully, you know, again, it's a performance tuning thing, right? That's a great question. And again, keep in mind, we're doing stream. So this is bytes. So there's no, like, um, there's no official, like, hey, you know, this, no. It's just a stream of data that's going in there. And oh, by the way, this thing will start to, it's just like any stopped up plumbing in your house, right? Things get slower and slower and slower in the network, right? That's why, you know, the coders start going nuts, right? There's, there's a whole, you can see the performance implications, right? Does this make sense? All right, so we have our server running. Uh, oh, let me get this server back up. 
Okay, our server's running. And let me run this client. 192.168.56. What do we say? 101. And what was our port? 45,000? Okay. Uh, there's a file I put out there called uh, hamlet.txt. It's the infamous soliloquy, right? So. And it blew up, of course. Oh, why did it blow up? Exactly. Exactly. So we got a connection request came in, comes in. No such file or directory for Hamlet. That's sitting in our, our root directory. Let's see if we can, uh, let's see where, well, let's do this. Let's ask get current working directory. So we're sitting at home vagrant TCP directory. Now let's look in there and see if there's, if Hamlet's in there. No, he's not. All right, so that's a good catch. So what do we do about that? Well, let's move Hamlet in here and see if ha anything, we can correct it that way. Um, where did I put Hamlet? Uh, let me go, uh, bear with me. I know where Hamlet is. You go to home. You go to, uh, oh, here it is. Slow on the uptake. Where do we say that was? TCP? Yeah, TCP, right? Okay, now we should be, let's make sure we got them in there. Hamlet's in that directory. Let's restart that. I keep wanting to do that. I'm in the TCP directory, right? Get rid of a couple of these. Go to TCP. Uh, what was it? Server 2? Let me run server 2. Start the whole thing over again. 192.168.56.101, right? Then let's, I don't know, let's call it 41. Uh, let's start this guy up. Client 2. 192.168.56.101 on uh, 41,000, right? Uh, Hamlet. .txt. There you go. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we got the connection request. Uh, we just dumped this out to the screen, but when we go out to the client, the most important thing is to keep in mind during the file transfer, we're opening a local file and we're just writing it out to disk, right? So here, we're pulling in, you know, in this case, Hamlet is less than, certainly less than 1024, but. Um, we're just, we're just writing the data out to disk as we pull it in from the server, right? And that was a great catch, whoever made it, I think it was you, on, hey, we got no flexibility in the server, right? So think about this. We could easily do all this stuff ourselves, build servers and all that kind of stuff, but you got Apache, you got web servers, they, there's a lot of utilities and tools out there that already do it. All right, let's step up our game. Um, 
and do a directory search. Let's get rid of, uh, in this case, what we're going to do is we started out with just TCP message, simple message passing. Then we moved up to a file transfer, but the problem was we couldn't find the file. Uh, now what we'll do is incorporate the code that we had earlier with the OS walk and let the server, when it gets a request, go searching through the directories until it finds some, right? Hopefully, until it blows up. Let me get rid of a few of these. Uh, and I'm going to get rid of this. Okay. Uh, so server three. I keep wanting to do that. File open. Let me do uh, decrypt up one. Uh, it was server three, right? Okay. Now, you guys should recognize this code, right? This is our, right? Everybody see this? This is the exact same code that we used earlier for, you know, scanning through OS walk, right? We're going to pull out these. We're going to search through all the directories until we hit a match. Until we hit a match. And notice what we're doing here. We're taking the name and we're just automatically making them both capital letters so that I don't have a capital H A M L E T and a lowercase H A M L E T. All right, so let's, let's fire this guy up. Uh, 192.168.56. Dot 101, right? Um, question. E four. Do let's uh, let's give it a default. Oh man, let's give it a default directory of where's Hamlet? Uh, let's say home. We'll start there on the search. Okay, and let's get uh, client three. Really, client three isn't doing anything different. I just wanted to make the numbers match. So why, am I, why do I keep uh, changing the port numbers every time I start up the server? Why, why don't I just keep reusing the same number? You might have already said this. I just didn't understand. What? Think about TCP and how it shuts down a connection. After, even after it goes away, that, those ports are going to stay open for a period of time because you can have, it's a stream. It's a data stream. So you can have a stream still in flight. So the operating systems, various operating systems act differently, but most operating systems are going to keep that connection alive. And that's why you see, when you're looking at a sniffer or an analyzer or, you know, whatever, you're seeing it goes into you know, this, this wait kind of closed state, semi-closed state, and then a fin. You know, that's the whole final closing up of it. So that can take a considerable amount of time. That's why I'm constantly using these different numbers. It's annoying because you start. All right, so we got it. this guy listening. Uh, 54,000. Now, I didn't really change this, as I recall. Um, 192.168.56.101 and what was it? 54,000? Uh, Hamlet. By the way, this still might fail on Ubuntu because <laughs> I did this one time, I deleted Hamlet and uh, you know, when I did the search it went into the trash folder and found a deleted Hamlet. So could blow up. No promises. Oh, there we go. So it went in uh, really just a small variation on what we did the last three, four iterations. We did a directory search. Then we did simple TCP message passing, right? Then we talked about uh, once we got that going, then we said, hey, you know what? Let's... Let's do more than just send a message, hello world. Let's send a file, let the server look that up. He couldn't find it because he had no search uh, ability. 
Then finally, we added the code that we started out with. All, it's the same program. We just keep adding to it. And that's the point. This stuff is so flexible that it's very easy to take these small little routines and grow them into something substantial. Right? Now, the next step is, what do we do to Hamlet? Hamlet's whole thing in life was to like, keep his thoughts secret from the evil king. Right? Right? We sent that in the clear. So, you know, Polonius or whatever his name is, the, the, uh, you know, the evil king and his mother, who he's trying to hide all these messages, she sees it. She's got an a analyzer. What do we need to do? We need to encrypt. We need to encrypt. What else, what else are we missing? Suppose the king got into the server and started looking at the files there. We need to make sure that that hasn't been tampered with. How do we do that? Well, we can build hashes. Once we build Hamlet, we can run a one-way hash against that file. And then it will not matter. If he changes one bit, that hash, that algorithm is calculated. That's the one-way hash thing that we're talking about. That algorithm will come out differently. So what we'll do, and I don't think we're going to make it today, <laughs> But uh, what we will look at is when, in this case, we sent the, the first time the client sent the file name in, uh, and then the server sent the file back. Well, with the hash, what we'll do is we'll send in the file, and the server will send us back. He'll calculate a hash and send it back to us. Client will save that to disk. Then the next time he goes looking for that, he's going to say, hey, give me Hamlet. The server will send back that file, Hamlet, again, he'll run the hash on Hamlet, and if those two hashes, the one that he stored and the one that came back, don't match, he knows the king was, at, was in that server, right? Uh, what else do we need? Again, we're only protecting that it hasn't changed while it was sitting on the server. We need to encrypt that, so we need an SSL connection, right? So, how do we do that? Well, um, the way that Python does it is, does anybody know what a VPN is? <laughs> what, what do you do in a VPN? You guys are staying after if you don't get this question right. <laughs> you tunnel. You build a tunnel, right? You build a tunnel. That's exactly what happens with an SSL connection. Exactly. It's called, only the programmers call it socket wrapping. Right? Because they had nothing better to call it, right? All you're doing is you're setting up the exact same connection that we just set up. We send in a connect message, you know, comes back, does all that stuff. Then what happens is you set up an SSL wrapper that hides that socket. It encrypts that socket. So it builds a socket uh, connection to the server, an encrypted socket connection that's passing the, the socket information underneath it, encrypted. Does that make sense? That's all we're doing. And it's, it's really simple, but it's complex. I left the, the certs out there. In order to, to, to do it, you actually have to generate your own certificate file. There's a whole negotiation. So uh, I didn't have access to VeriSign. So uh, uh, let me run through it. I know we're not going to get, what time is it? Hey, we're getting a little long in the tooth here. Um, what do you guys want to do? I, I can go through. You want to cut it? You want me to go? <laughs> uh, let, me, let me just run through some of the presentations real quick, and I promise I'll let you out. Um, and Because I, I definitely talk about this. Uh, we did the search thing. We know how that works, right? Uh, we're old hands at this. Do the lookup, blah, blah, blah. Let me talk about. OK, here's our hash stuff. I don't know if I, I don't think we're going to have time to. So this is the way, uh, it's kind of a weird name. I was running out of things to say. <laughs> so I called one, the client, um, you know, get hash, and the server give hash, right? So hash server get hash. Sounds like a drug-infested party. And we're doing the exact same thing. 
uh, we send the file name in. He's going to open and calculate a hash on it, sends the, the MD5 hash back. I'm going to store it. And then the next time, I think I have it here. The next time I connect in, send it, he goes, he retreat, sends back the, the file. Now I have an old hash. I generate the new hash on that file that came in. If they're not the same, you know, I know somebody's been at it. Um, let me just show you what uh, like a hash looks like, and I'll let you go. You guys want to get out of here? Or? No? Uh, hold on one second. Maybe we can even do a couple of one ways real quick. Where did I put that? Uh, let me, oh, hash list, hashish list. All right, you're going to love this. All right, here, what we're going to do is, when you hash something, it's just an algorithm, it's a mathematical operation, prime numbers, all that kind of nonsense. Uh, the first thing that, that Python lets you do, one of the things it lets you do is tell you uh, how many, what, what kind of algorithms it supports, right? And actually, it needs to do that because of the way negotiation goes uh, during an SSL uh, session negotiation, right? I've got to tell it, the other side, what I can support. So there's a way to query it, so it'll tell you, here are the following algorithms that I support. And in this case, MD5, SHA-224, you know, on and on and on. You guys know this. So let's just enter a string and apply those algorithms uh, to the string. What do you want to enter? Um, I want beer. And there you go. The um, MD5, there's the hash. There's the SHA-1 all the way down to 512. And if you want to verify that I'm not lying, I've, I've embedded the link here that um, actually will go there. And we can, we can cut and paste these, you know, if you want to use it as a utility, you can cut and paste these off, and they're valid hash, hashes, hashes. We just use our web browser thing. <clears throat> so there's a little utility that, that you can you can enter just to prove I'm not lying. Let's do uh, you know, SHA-256. I'm going to take, uh, what was my string? I think it, you give it the string. Do I want beer? And we're doing 256, right? I forget if this works or not. Come on. Okay. All right, here's our here's our hex value and the answer is 9094. Does anybody want to count that off? going to be a quiz over this. Memorize this number. Uh, so we did SHA-256, 2AC50, right? And there's the, the hash. Oh, by the way, uh, just as an aside, when we calculate those hashes, we can, we can uh, you know, display them or use them in any way we want, right? Like we can make them all binary. We can make that a binary string. It's most common to represent it, that hash, as a hex number, right? And that's what you're seeing here. So I think uh, we did 256, right? 9094-3391. 9094-3391, okay? So, uh, and again, you can cut and paste these. Use them as, you know, whatever. Okay. So you got that one. Let's see what else we can do in here real quick. Um, any questions while I look for a uh, demo that won't blow up? What do you guys think? Ah, too long.
Most of these will be too long. We have like 10 minutes left. How about we, uh, you guys want more or less? I'll tell you what is in the uh, presentation. And all the code that I have is what you have. So um, let me go through the rest of it, what we were going to cover.